just a warm good morning to everybody. Just a warm up before we start, um, as it were, formally. Uh, when you started to wish one of our colleagues here a happy birthday, I know that you have become a really uh, not not just a, a scholarly community, but also a social community, um, which is which is really important because I think part of this uh, winter school is to try to create bonds between you. I mean, that's very important. And somehow you become alumni of this winter school, and you are sort of the first batch of graduates from the winter school. Uh, uh, so your sort of inaugural uh, participation has led also to knowing something about each other. Um, now, I, I admire the courage of the person. Was it, was it your birthday? Yes. Yes, I admire your courage because I would never ever sort of admit to when my birthday was and I wouldn't want anybody to uh, wish me a happy birthday. But I might sort of change, I would be prepared to change my mind, of course, if uh, the value and the length of the presence, a present that I'll be getting is commensurate with the length of my life on this earth. So. On that condition, I would sort of declare um, how young I am. So um, actually, the great thing about being an academic and working in the classroom is that uh, every year, um, you are exactly the same age. So when people say to me, how old are you? And I say, I'm 26. They say, 26? I say, I've been 26 for the last 100 years. They say, how come? I say every year the students who come to study with me, when they start, they're 18. They're, all, they're always 18, right? If they can always be 18, I can always be 26. It does make sense, doesn't it? Uh, um, but also I say to my students, I remember when I was at the University of Edinburgh and um, young people have that sort of great burst of youth which is so delightful to see and to experience and to, to nurture. But sometimes there is an excess of that sort of um, flush of youth and, and also, and in 1997, um, uh, I was sort of exactly this sort of kind of youth and that was the year in which Diana, Princess of Wales, uh, died, you know? So I used to say to them, uh, look, don't be enamored with the youth, don't be sort of, arrogant about being young because there's absolutely no guarantee that you would live to be as long as I have, I am, right? And they say, what? How, how come? And I say, well, look at Princess Diana. She was 36 and she was cut down you know, and she lost her life at that age. So you can be a princess, a very young person. You can be very beautiful, very rich. So on my side, I don't have youth on my side, no longer sort of youth on my side but I have longitude and I have also a long MOT. So that I've gone and I've been, um, I've been sort of allowed as a vehicle to be driven on the roads for a long time. So anyway, this is in order to keep you busy for other people to come. So this is in a way a trick, a ruse. Um, and I hope that you have fallen for it. If you haven't, then clearly I have failed. So. Maybe I should look for a career in, in, in media. So when, the, when something goes wrong, they just call on me and say, can you please just blabber away for two, three minutes until we fix the cameras? So, uh, right. So, Sonia, start. Where's Sonia? Yeah? Start. Thank you. Uh, my talk is about language as a symbolic resource in community relations. Now, let me just try to introduce this by telling you why I've chosen this topic. I've chosen this topic because, first of all, I rashly volunteered to Dana, who's ferocious in the way that she p pursues you. Um, and I said, oh, it would be nice to, say, to, to, to be part of it. She said, oh, I'll just give a talk. I said, oh, yeah, that would be a good idea. So before she started to put the program together, she, phoned, she, she sent me an email and she said, oh, you're giving a talk. I said, Haven't, I thought you had forgotten about this. And, uh, I was hoping that she, she, she might have, but uh, she said, no, you're giving a talk. I said, oh, dear me, this is about sectarianism, communitarianism, about the nation. How could I just inject myself in a conversation 
with people who are specialists in this field. I am interested in language as a social political phenomenon. Um, then I said, well, I could do something that I have done in the past. I've talked about it, about, about sectarianism and language in, and community and language in the Arab world, and I could just maybe go to Lebanon. Uh, and my initial idea was just to go to Lebanon. Um, and then I changed my mind because I read that one of the participants is from the Republic of Ireland. Is, is he here? He's gone, maybe. Left us. Yeah. Unfortunately. I thought, oh, oh, there's somebody from Northern Ireland. Let me do something about Northern Ireland uh, because Northern Ireland must be interesting. Um, so I decided to uh, talk to you about Northern Ireland um, and language as a symbolic resource in community relations in Northern Ireland. So it has nothing to do with this part of the world. But there is also inside me um, this desire to, to write back somehow, to, um, to strike back. You, you're familiar with the title of the book, The Empire the Strikes Back, but the Right Back, Postcolonial sort of Writing. And I thought, we're always the subject. We're always being studied in this part of the world. There's a delight, so the delicious irony in turning ourselves into specialists who talk about others. So they become Arabs and we become the West. And we talk about them instead of they're always talking about us. You know, uh, Sometimes they talk about themselves, but most of the time they pose as specialists on us. So can we pose ourselves not as specialists, but as people who know something about them, as it were? So in a way, there is uh, an attempt on my part to try to, to do this. So let me begin. What I really want to do today is to try to outline a way of, for, for, for people interested in language to inject themselves in a conversation in a winter school, in a conference on um, nation, on community, on conflict, and on sect. How do we, as people interested in language, as a social phenomenon, phenomenon do this. So I'm painting, young people always talk about models and things. I'm talking about a framework. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of, uh, I'm precocious, a little bit sort of hesitant in saying that I have a model. But I think I have a, I'm proposing a way of saying if you want to inject yourself in a conversation about conflict from a linguistic point of view, maybe this is a set of, I'm providing a set of ideas that you can use and how to relate them to each other. So it's about a framework and using Northern Ireland as a case study, as a test case. And I'm actually going to focus on about six weeks in the history of Northern Ireland in 2014. That's what I'm going to do. Um, so my talk is a first part, is a presentation of the bare outlines of the framework. Then I move to a case study where I actually tell you what had happened in those two weeks. And then after that, I move to an analysis. Uh, and you'll see that I haven't begun with a question. I've begun with, I've begun with uh, I'm interested in this. I have a set of things that are, you know, and I want to put them together and let me try. Now I can write a question. I can write a really good question. This is my research question, having written sort of my paper. So let me begin. My aim in this lecture is to present the main elements of a framework for investigating the role of language in intercommunity relations, and then to proceed to show how this framework works in a specific case in which socio-political stress or conflict is a defining feature. It is a truism to say that language is a marker of identity at the individual and group levels. The fact that both language and identity are elusive terms should not deter us from exploiting the contextually circumscribed links that bind them together in the social world. I'm happy to talk about the elusive part of this if you want in the question and answer session. The framework I'm proposing here consists of different elements or strands as follows. One, language is often used to express concerns of an extra-linguistic nature in society. Talk about language, especially in situations of societal stress or conflict, is often talk about concerns that transcend language. I call this the proxy rule of language. 
This function is in line with Gramsci's insightful observation that, quote, every time the question of language surfaces, in one way or another, it means that a series of other problems is coming to the fore, unquote. Two, so proxy number one. Two, to access this role of language, we need to draw a distinction between the instrumental and symbolic functions of language. Instrumental and symbolic. Instrumentality refers to the primary role of language as a means of communication in its oral and written forms. And I would be adding later on a semiotic dimension uh, to my talk. From a professional point of view, linguists and grammarians are primarily interested in this role, instrumentality. Symbolism refers to the use of language as a proxy for talk about extra linguistic concerns. It's not talk about language, but about something which is beyond language, behind language. Sociolinguists, though not all of them, tend to be interested in this role of language, the symbolic one. However, these two functions are always interconnected. We exploit language instrumentally to talk reflexively about language symbolism. It is a symbolic role of language that enables it, enables it to act as a boundary setter, and that's very important, as a boundary setter between groups, be they sex, communities, ethnicities, nations, or even classes, or professional uh, regions, what have. Three, identity is relational, but does not necessarily have to be antagonistic. It is a subject, it is subject to the principle of alterity, or what, might be, or what may be called the vis-a-vis -vis principle. I talked about that yesterday in my comments on Saad's talk. The symbolic power of language as identity marker gets accentuated when identity gains in salience under exciting, inciting conditions. Four, language as a resource in society, instrumentally and symbolically, is a resource in society, instrumentally and symbolically. It is this fact that makes it available for top-down or bottom-up use in task orientation at the inter and intra levels of human interaction. Number one, yeah, that's. Now I approach this from the position or from the perspective of language ideology. This language ideology binds a lot of these things together. Language ideology is at the heart of the framework I'm proposing here because it enables us to link task orientation to social action. I'm aware that there are many understandings of ide ideology in the literature, and that ideology is a maligned concept in society to the extent that it is used in scholarship in a dismissive manner to brand something as non-factual, concocted, or partisan. But this does not have to be the case if we understand ideology in a self-aware way or manner. For the purpose of this lecture and the framework, I understand ideology as the, and it's a quotation from Frieden, who's a, an expert on this topic. He says, ideology is a set of ideas, beliefs, opinions, and values in society that, one, exhibit a recurring pattern, two, are held by significant groups, three, can be used to compete over providing and controlling plans for public policy, and that's very important for me, and four, do so with the aim of justifying, contesting, or changing the social and political arrangements and processes of political community. So it's actually trying to make a change in society and in the political arrangements. We may call, we may call this kind of contestation ideological dueling, the idea of duel, um, the idea of you know, dueling. Six, and this is the last point in the framework, in most conflict situations, where language is involved, language as a symbolic resource is hardly ever the cause of conflict or war, particularly war. Therefore, talk about language wars, you see this amongst the particularly French uh, sociolinguists, must therefore be understood in a metaphorical sense, it's an rhetorical sense. Two, by way of summary, the key concepts in the fr framework I'm proposing here are, one, language as proxy, which is there, you can see it, Two, language instrumentality versus language symbolism. Three, alterity, alterity or the vis-a-vis -vis principle. Task orientation, language ideology, 
language dueling, and language wars. My talk will not exploit all of these concepts equally, but you will see that I'll bring them in in my analysis of the case study. Now I'm moving to the case study. To test this framework, I will consider an example from Northern Ireland as a case study. And this is Northern Ireland. I'm sure that you have seen the map. Maybe you had seen it uh, before. But Northern Ireland is that sort of uh, white, whitish thing on the uh, uh, top right-hand corner of Ireland. And then you can see on the other side, Scotland and Wales and the rest of the United Kingdom. I have chosen Northern Ireland because I believe it allows us to touch on all three dimensions in the title of this inaugural winter school. And I want to congratulate the Alp Centre for starting it. Um, they're innovators, and this is one of their great innovations. And the, these are sectarianism, communitarianism, and the state. As a case study, Northern Ireland displays an intercommunity and sectar sectarian dimension. This dimension works at the sub-state level. Northern Ireland also presents an inter-nation and inter-state dimension through the involvement of the Republic of Ireland. We may therefore talk about a supra-state dimension as well. These two dimensions are animated by a low-intensity conflict, which helps us reveal in greater clarity how the various parts of the framework I'm proposing work in real life. Actually, when language is dormant, the framework still works. But you, if you want to see it clearly, you need a situation of conflict. Another reason, albeit a tangential one, for choosing Northern Ireland is this. Remember, I believe about, I talked about symbolism, language as a symbol. It is this. It enables us, Northern Ireland, to see how some entrenched conflicts acquire symbolic power through appropriation to signify local meanings away from whom. The conflict in Palestine is such a conflict. In the Northern Irish context, the conflict between the nationalists, sometimes called Catholics or Republicans, and the unions, Protestants and loyalists, is grafted on the two sides in the conflict in Palestine through the association of the former with the Palestinians, the nationalists, Republicans, the Catholics. They become somehow symbolically Palestinian. And the latter, the loyalists, unionists, Protestants, with the Israelis in the public sphere. As I'm going to show you a number of display, uh, um, PowerPoints, as the following displays, or displays of identification association reveal. Before I show them to you, I was driven to this, drawn to this. Um, I should say, the, I remember the professor of, the Regis professor of Hebrew at, at Cambridge. Um, I had a, an Israeli Jewish PhD student, um, really a brilliant, he's now great future and great present um, too. Now, he was studying with me, and this is, I, I, I used to joke, this is the first time in history that, that a Palestinian has control over the destiny of an Israeli Jew. So, um, and people were sort of always curious about uh, this Israeli Jew being, being supervised by a Palestinian. How does it work? So the professor of religious Hebrew, um, religious professor of Hebrew at, at Cambridge, uh, he's from Northern Ireland, he's a Protestant. So he wanted to talk to my student, Yoni. He called him in. And he said, Yoni, before I talk to you, are you blue or green? And he said, I'm blue, uh, sir. And he said, fine, I can talk to you now more freely. Now, blue and green, you'll see what's meant by blue and green in the context of Northern Ireland. Dua number one. Now, you look at this. <laughs> if you look at this, it's quite an interesting uh, one. On the left-hand side, you see, um, is the other with you? No. Uh, you see, on the, the left-hand side, you see a Palestinian flag with a Republican flag. And this is, because you can't see it there, Palestinian and Irish flags, that's what it says there, flying from lampposts in Bogside neighborhood of Dar Dari, left uh, an Israeli flag in a union district of West Belfast, and on the right, there's an Israeli flag on the... In, in, in West Belfast. So in, if you go to actually to Belf, to, to Northern Ireland and some urban centers, you will see Palestine and Israel painted in murals and flags and you know, and you will know that when you see the Palestinian flag, you are in a Catholic Republican nationalist area. And when you see the Israeli flag, 
you are most probably in a Protestant uh, loyalist unionist area. Um, and so there's an Israeli flag and a Palestinian flag. If you go down to the next one, you maybe don't see it very well, but you can see the Palestinian flag there. Yeah? And this is the Museum of, Museum of Free Dairy. And the Palestinian flag is painted on the window. Now, in Northern Ireland, there is a difference between the same, no, Derry and London Derry are exactly the same place physically. But if you are a Protestant, it is London Derry, but if you are a Catholic, it is Derry without London Derry. Right? Place names become very, very important. So this is free Derry. No? You know that you are a nationalist area. So the Palestinian dispute is grafted onto something, or another one, uh, an Irish dispute is grafted onto the Palestinian dispute. Next one. This is another one, and this one is from a, uh, in the Bogside neighborhood of Derry. Bogside, this is a Catholic area. And now they are declaring who they are, so they have a Palestinian flag. Now the next one, it's quite an interesting one. This is in Northumberland Road, West Belfast, a unionist area. And what you have there is a pro-Israeli mural. You can see the Israeli flag. The Israeli flag tends to be described as a blue flag. So are you blue or green? And if you're Palestinian, this is the, the idea. Green is Catholic, Palestinian, uh, nationalist, um, Republican. And blue becomes, now the Israeli flag color becomes uh, Protestant, Unionist, and Loyalist. So what you have, two conflicts. And the Palestinian conflict is now used symbolically. It has become a symbol to signify loyalty, uh, not, a, not a loyalty, but uh, to simply singly, uh, signify um, the contours of a conflict in a, in a different place. The next one. Now you can't see it, but in the middle, you can see the Palestinian flag. There are Palestinian flags there. And this is uh, on an international wall, corner of Falls Road and Northumberland Street in West Belfast. Now you are in a, in a Catholic part of West Belfast. And this is Liberation Wall from Africa and others, and the Palestinians are right there. Um, so, and it's a wall. And you can see how important the idea of the wall is because of the uh, occupation wall or of the exclusion wall in Palestine. If you haven't seen it, uh, if, you, if you actually go and look at it, and if you have pictures of the Berlin Wall, the Berlin Wall would be sort of like a little joke in comparison. And now you can see also the next one, uh, um, Palestinian flags that's flown in. Um, and lastly, the last one is UN 194. This is the same road one. This is United Nations Res Resolution 194. This was passed, I think, in 1948 or 1948. And it demanded the return of the Palestinian refugees to uh, their places of residence and those uh, and for compensation, and those who do not want to go back will just get sort of bigger compensation. But you can just see I've chosen Northern Ireland because Palestine and the Palestinian-Israeli dispute has a resonance elsewhere. It has, become, it has become a symbol. It has become something that denotes something beyond itself, outside itself, and has been grafted onto uh, a conflict in Northern Ireland. Now let me now turn to the... Uh, case study. After about 30 years of what is called the Troubles with a capital T between 1968 and 1998, the parties to the conflict in Northern Ireland signed what came to be known as the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, not, no, can we just go back? No. This agreement set out to resolve the conflict between the unions and uh, the Protestants, the, sorry, the unions and the, and the nationalists. Um, through a constitutional settlement that recognized the legitimacy of competing claims by proposing a system of power sharing through a Northern Irish Assembly and Executive. This is the, one of B Tony Blair's biggest achievements in 1998, called the Good Friday because it was signed on Good Friday. The British and Irish governments, as well as eight political parties, signed this agreement which was later ratified in referenda in both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. In addition to, this, to its cross-community English name, the Good Friday Agreement, this agreement was designated differently by the nationalists and unions. Next one. So the nationalists refer to it, yeah. The nationalists give it that name at the top, and the unions give it the name at the bottom. So there are two different names. 
Um, this agreement, so in, in, in fact, these names are not instrumental names. They are not intended to, to convey a meaning uh, in, the, in, the, in the semantic sense of meaning. They are intended to convey political messages. So the language is now not used instrumentally. It is used symbolically. It's used ideologically. It's used to achieve something in the extra-linguistic extra world. This agreement was followed by another in 2006, the St. Andrews Agreement, after the university town of St. Andrews in Scotland. Again, this was named differently by the contending groups in, the, uh, Northern, Ireland, in, in Northern Ireland for symbolic reasons. Uh, so these are, again, two different names for the same agreement, one in Irish and one in Ulster, Ulster, Ulster Scots. And these two languages, actually, these two, they're related to each other. Genealogically, they are related to each other. A third agreement, the Stormont House Agreement, was signed on the 23rd of December 2014 after 11 weeks of difficult cross-party negotiations. This agreement tried to put flesh on the bones of the earlier agreements by specifying a framework for dealing with a set of outstanding disputes, including finance and welfare, flags, identity, culture, and tradition, parades. If you know Northern Ireland, parades are very, very important, the Orange Parades in particular, the past, and institutional reform. It is important to stress here that cross-culture, that culture-bound issues proved to be the thorniest to agree. They agreed on finance, on everything, but those things were the thorniest to agree because we contend of their contested meaning for the two communities. By way of comparison with the Middle East, again, coming back to the Middle East, we may note how the recently promulgated basic law of the State of Israel, the one that emphasized the Jewishness of the state, which was uh, issued in June 2018, gives high, pro I was surprised, high prominence to the symbolic motifs of the Jewishness of the state, including, and if you read it, it spends more time talking about history then it spends more time talking about flags, state emblem, national anthem, Hebrew language, Hebrew calendar, Independence Day, Remembrance Day, Holocaust, and Sabbath as, as defined as, as markers of the state. These are cultural symbols. So cultural symbols are the ones sometimes in negotiations that are very difficult to resolve. People find it easier to accept or uh, to come to agreements about money, about, about, but these things are so important. The nationalists had hoped that the negotiations, in the Stormont negotiations, would recognize Irish as an official language in Northern Ireland. But no such res resolution was reached, although both the British and Irish governments supported such a resolution. Against this background, attempts were made when talk about language was on the agenda amongst the, con the contesting parties. Uh, attempts were made in the run-up to the Stormont Agreement to sour the atmosphere between the two negotiating groups by exploiting the symbolic and ideological loadings of the issue, meanings of, the, of language. One such spanner in the works was an attack on the nationalist demand to establish Irish as an official language on equal footing with English in Northern Ireland. Thus, in an assembly debate on the 3rd of November 2014, this is the starting point, Gregory Campbell of the Democratic Unionist Party, this is a it's a unionist party, it's largely loyalist, largely Protestant, attacked this demand by mocking the Irish language, next, by mocking the Irish language, um, sorry, which, which some nationalist MPs, nationalist MPs in the assembly, in the, National, in the Northern Irish assembly, used to top and tail their speeches in English. So they would begin their speech in Irish, and they end in Irish, so topping and tailing. English, Campbell used the expression, which as you can see at the top, PowerPoint 15, curry my yogurt, can Coca-Cola, I don't know how to pronounce it. Apparently this is intended to imitate and to mock and to parody what the Irish, that Irish nationalist MPs used to top their speeches in parliament. And if you listen to, to it on, you go to the YouTube and you listen, you'll see that the top is very, what he said, curry my yogurt, kanka kolia, somehow sounds like what the Irish MPs say when they start their speeches in the Northern Irish Assembly and finish. So he was trying to mock the language, say, curry my yogurt, right? Now, um, Campbell 
was asked by the speaker to apologize, and he refused. And therefore, he was banned from taking part in the discussions or in the work of the assembly for a day. What, he was, what, he, what was he trying to do? He was trying to incite, to annoy, to attack the other community, and trying, therefore, to sour the atmosphere and make it more difficult for an agreement to take place about the Irish language in Northern Ireland, that Irish will be recognized on par with English. Now, the next one, that's our friend uh, Campbell. Um, addressing a DUP, which is a, a, a unionist party, uh, conference on 26 November 2014, Cam Campbell repeated the same expression. So this is the conference to emphasize that under no circumstances would he apologize to the nationalists. Campbell accompanied this ethnic slur with a pot of yogurt and a tin of paste, curry paste, saying, so I got some yogurt today, that's what he said, and I am looking forward to lunch because they tell me there is some curry there today. And that's, you know, this is the yogurt in his hand. This action was, can you show in the next one, please? No, no go back, yeah. This action was later inscribed in a poster to taunt the nationalists. Can you show us the poster? Yeah. This is the poster. So this is a keep calm and curry my yogurt, right? And this had gained greater currency in Northern Ireland. And, and, and it became a, people were sort of, this is, a, again, people were dueling. And now they were dueling not through language, but actually through semiotic means, through something else. Now, I'm going to stop here for a little while. Maybe some of you will say, ah, this reminds me of something else, doesn't it? Because if you are actually in the European context, the British context, it would remind you of the next one, Doha. Yeah, not the next one, sorry, the next one, yes. Keep calm and carry on. Have you seen? No? I mean, in the British context, yes, uh, okay, we have people, yeah? Yeah, okay, please say yes for me, because otherwise they think that I'm inventing this. Uh, keep calm and carry on. You can buy mugs, you can buy it in the, you know, this, is, this has become uh, a piece of, of, of public art. Now, this has a history. This was first promulgated in 1939, just before the Second World War. 2,500 2, were printed, and then uh, they were not distributed for lots of other reasons. Anyway, they were pulped, and in the end, somewhere in Anik, up north in, um, in Northumberland, in a small bookshop, that's not that's a good bookshop, they found this poster and the man, the, the, the owners of the bookshop, then put it outside, people liked it, and then it became, it's, it's, it, is, it just went viral, this one, really, truly went viral, right? So keep calm and carry on. Now what we have here, we have a strategy of using intertextuality. What happens if you go, go first, go back, go back, 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 and there. This, if you are, this, if you are in, in the, con the British contest, will immediately remind you of the other one. This is intertextualizing with the earlier poster, right? And it takes you back, in that sense, in your mind, to a moment of enormous danger for Britain. This is at the time of the Nazi sort of, uh, of the Second World War. So you can't, in your own mind, you'll always read this in relation to the other one. So you bring the meanings of the older poster into reading this poster. I'm not going to go into this with greater sort of depth. But can you go to the next one? This is an interesting one. Uh, this was also, but it didn't gain currency, this one. Somebody canned, packaged, put uh, Campbell in this, um, in this soup. You can see his picture there. Yeah? It's Campbell's and says concentrated uh, uh, curried yogurt, right? Uh, and then says new, and then after that says bitter orange flavor. Now this is most probably a Protestant unionist loyalist trying to taunt the nationalist community. You know about Campbell's soup? No, those in Britain, the British will know, and the Americans will know about Campbell's soup, yeah? So Campbell's soup is a very famous sinner. And it's famous because this is a piece of art that was, it was actually Andy Warhol who did the 32 um, drawings for um, um, art, art, artwork for the Campbell soup. So what we have here is, again, intertextualizing with the soup, and then says curried yogurt, 
there is Campbell there, but inside it says bitter. You know what bitter means. And then orange. Now, orange is very important because now we're referring to the orange order, to the orange marches in Northern Ireland. You see these guys marching in, in, in nationalist areas, Protestants marching in nationalist areas, defining them of their defeat in the past, right? So it's actually playing on history. And you can see that now we are outside language using popular culture as a semiotic motif, emblem, sign, symbol, to duel with the other party. And this becomes somehow semiotically a kind of language. This is a kind of language because it means something in its cultural context. Can you continue? Yeah. No, thank you. Now, uh, Campbell then continued addressing two leaders of the Nationalist Party, Sinn Féin. He said, on behalf of our party, this is the uh, Protestant uh, unionist, he says, quote, on behalf of our party, let me say clearly and slowly so that Catriona Rouen, this is the nationalist minister of culture in the uh, Irish, Northern Irish government, uh, and Jerry Adams, famous character, um, understand, we will never agree to an Irish language act at Stormont, and we will treat their entire wish list as no more than toilet paper. They better get used to it, unquote. In response, members of Sinn Féin, this is the major nationalist party, Republican Party, Catholic Party, and other nationalist parties accused Campbell not just of insulting the Irish language, but also of racism. Now, language racism becomes racism, just racism. Because the language becomes the people. The language becomes the history of the people. It becomes all of those. That is the symbolic meaning of language. Commenting on Campbell's speech at the party conference, John Ordut uh, of Sinn Féin said that, quote, clearly Mr. Campbell was sticking two fingers up to the Irish language community, unquote. Dominic Bradley, another nationalist, but now from the Social, Social Democratic Liberal Heart Party, which is not as um, pro-separation, um, um, pro the Republican stance position as, as the others in the nationalist, uh, on the nationalist side, uh, said about Campbell, his comments were beneath contempt, adding, quote, Mr. Campbell may think he is targeting Sinn Féin with these slurs, but the Irish language community is much wider and deeper than the membership of any one political party. Irish language speakers, those who aspire to speak Irish, and all right-minded people who respect the language of others will be insulted and disappointed by Gregory Campbell's antics this weekend. Ridiculing Campbell, um, he actually continued, um, he said, well, if you go to the etymology of Campbell's name in Ulster Scots, which is a sister language to Irish, he said Campbell means crooked mouth. And then he added, I doubt if there is a more appropriately named polit po politician in the, uh, on the entire island of Ireland uh, like, like Campbell. Patsy Malone, another uh, SDP, SDLP member, said, and I quote her, saying, um, um, uh, uh, quote, I don't speak Irish to make a political point or to offend members of the DUP, the Democratic Union's party. I speak Irish because I can and because I love the language. It's part of who I am, where I have come from, and where I would like to see our society go. I make no apologies for being a proud Irish speaker, but I do speak to accommodate others by offering a translation after I've spoken uh, Irish in the uh, uh, assembly chamber. I hope towards the end to put this and work with you to try to analyze it and to see how most of what I've said will just be distilled in our anal analysis of this quotation. The approach of mutual accommodation and respect for difference is the only one which will offer real progress. End of quote. Now nationalists were really incensed by this. So they had their own um, art. And look at that. So they say Curry my yogurt, oil my AK-47. <laughs> Curry my yogurt, oil my AK-47. This is a threat. You know, we are going to, to get you. Um, the thing is this, I, you know, I enjoy, I've never given this paper. This is the first time. I'd love to give it in, in, in Cambridge because they'll say, uh, hmm, we've employed him to talk about them, and now this guy is talking about us. He's showing us to be as crazy as they are. But we can't be as crazy as they are, you know? Uh, um, Campbell was unperturbed by these and other attacks 
or threats, accusing the nationalists of politicizing the language issue. I'm going to actually skip and just move to the discussion. Let me just really summarize my, my points. Now, what have we done so far? Now, what I have been engaging here is not the instrumental function of language. I've been talking about language as something that language talks about. I have actually been looking at the symbolic meanings of language. Language has a symbolic meaning. I wanted also to show that the Irish language is used in a sectarian, communitarian, internationalist setting in order to express not linguistic matters, but actually to talk about politics, it's to talk about other things. Because there's, in my paper, talk about equality and how the nationalists admit they use language as a Trojan horse to press the point of equality. They, Jerry Adams says, it is our Trojan horse. We are not really interested in language per se, we are interested in something else. Language equality becomes, as it were, symbolic of equality on all fronts. Right? So, first of all, I engage the uh, question of, of language symbolism. Secondly, I try to say that language talks about things that are beyond language, the extra-linguistic world. That language is used in ideological dueling here. And that <clears throat> it is used for a purpose actually for two major purposes. The first purpose is to duel with the other side, is to press claims and then to respond to counter claims. Actually, in the case study, there are really sad cases because there are people who wanted to, unionists who wanted to turn Irish into a national language for the unions and the, the nationalists. And they form parties and all of that. And those people in the middle get squeezed out very, very quickly and they get actually accused of treason by the unionist uh, community because they are, they're promoting Irish, they're trying to learn Irish. So first of all, you're dueling with the other party. Secondly, you're aiming this at your own community. You're aiming it at your community for solidarity, for solidifying the community, for its own cohesion, and to prevent leakage. So those on the unionist part who expressed an interest in learning Irish were described as traitors. So you, want, you don't want people to start to make, you know, and to build bridges with the, with the other party. And all of this is done in the context of a language ideology. Can we please go back to the first, 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 yeah? Just to remind you of what I said about language, yeah, quickly, yeah, this time. Right, so let's go back. Exhibit a recurring pattern. I can tell you there's a recurring pattern of talk about language in Northern Ireland. Are held by significant groups, nationalists and unions. Can be used to compete over providing and controlling plans for public policy. That's precisely what's taking place here. There's competing over plans to control public policy. Because if you say that Irish is a, an official language, then you've got to teach it in the schools, you've got to provide a lot of support for it. And finally, can do so with the aim of justifying, contesting, or changing the social and political arrangements and processes of a political community. The unions want to maintain, they want to continue to control, they want the status quo to stay, whereas the nationalists are using language in order to justify contesting and changing that uh, public policy and the arrangement in society. That's what they're trying to do. Now, is this a language war? No, it's not a language war. Is war, is language the cause of this? No, it is not. But it is something through which we can read, we can read um, what's happening in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in this particular case and other cases where there is a sectarian uh, dimension. Now, uh, or, a, or a nationalist with a capital N sort of kind of dimension. Now, again, if we go to the next one, let me see what I've engaged. Yes, Dua, the next one. Yeah. So language has been used as a proxy. We're not talking about language. We're talking about something beyond language. We are not talking about verbs and nouns, which is what linguists do. We are talking about language as a symbol. It actually refers to something outside. We're talking about alterity or the vis-a-vis -vis principle. It's nationalists and unionists. The one community doesn't make sense without the other. You've got to have the two in order to be able to, about task orientation, about 
trying to change things, trying to make sure that you don't lose members of your own community, they stay loyal to you. I've engaged language ideology, the concept of language dueling, and I also engaged the question of a language war. The last one, the very, very last one. I mean, I've tried to summarize it without the sort of very nitty gritty detail of it um, because of the lack of time. Can you go to the last one? If you go at this one, I would like you to help me together. I want, as, as a group work, just let's see how we can begin to analyze this. I don't speak Irish to make a political point or to defend members of the DUP. This is a uh, Protestant loyalist uh, unionist party. I speak Irish because I can and because I love the language. It's part of who I am, where I have come from, and where I would like to see our society go. I, mo I make no apology apologies for being a proud Irish speaker, but I do see seek to accommodate others by offering a translation after I've spoken Irish in the assembly chamber. The approach of mutual accommodation and respect for difference is the only one which will offer real progress. Now, this is to me is discourse. That is what I mean by discourse for me. And now, how do I analyze, how do I analyze this bit of text, this bit of discourse, right? a slice of discourse? How do we analyze it? I would like to invite you to tell me what, what do you think. Starting from the top, I don't speak Irish to make a political point or to offend members of the DUP. What is the intention behind this? Can somebody please, yeah, shout out. Yeah, saying, well, I'm not, I'm not using language as a political instrument, right? Is that, is that what you think in the first sentence? And I'm not trying to annoy other people. Is that what she's really, the, is, is that what she means? What do you think? Doesn't she know that using Irish in the chamber annoys other people? Yeah? Come on, please. She does, she sure she does. So by actually the act of denial is in fact, is a sign for the assertion of, of the opposite, right? So this is, this, is, this is surface denial, but it's not deep denial. It is surface denial that actually speaks of, of affirmation of the fact that speaking Irish does annoy them. And that's why she uses it, most probably. But she is denying it, right? Let's see, I speak Irish because I can. So she's saying, I speak it because I am competent in it, right? But we always, you know, not everyone who's competent in any language uses it all the time. Uh, so competency is not the reason why somebody speaks a language. Let's uh, leave that one side, because I love the language. Now look at this, now, she loves the language. She doesn't love it in the way that somebody who speaks Chinese loves Chinese, who's not Chinese. She loves it, not, she loves it because she's an Irish speaker, a nationalist, a Republican, who wants to be part of the Republic of Ireland, she loves it because it's part of her history, of her childhood, of her, that's why she loves it, right? That is, love here is, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to stop, yeah. Um, and then, let's continue. It's part of who I am. Now, this is very important. Language is part of who I am. So it's part of my identity. Where I have come from, it's part of my past. Nationalism always is about, is about the past. And where I would like to see our society going, it's about the future. Look, it's about the past and the future. All of this compacted here, and we can actually dig deeper and deeper. I make no apologies for being a proud Irish speaker, right? I am very proud, so this is the idea of proud of, we are always proud in who we are, right? At moments of crisis, people say we are proud. You know, if you actually look at lots of posts, uh, after the death of Sultan Qaboos, may Allah have mercy on his soul. Lots of Omanis are saying, نحن فخورون, نحن أننا The word افتخر, افتخر, افتخر. And if you go hotels to, to hotels in the West after the siege here, it was quite interesting to look at guest books. And I can tell you that, I, I read in Paris recently, now, go east, go west, young man. Um, uh, there's nothing better than uh, Go east, go west, Qatar is the best. And then somebody writes underneath, go east, go west, Dubai is the best. And go east, go west, you know. So this is the idea. At moments of crisis, we start to be, to be really proud of who, who we are, and we pull together. So here, uh, I do speak, but 
she wants to be considerate, I do seek to accommodate others by offering a translation. What do you think of this, offering a translation? Because this is really uh, an amazing thing to say. Who do you translate for? Pardon? The other. You translate for the other. <laughs> for somebody who doesn't, you know. Actually, translation is normally used in order to say to somebody, you don't belong, so I'm translating for you. Let me translate this for you, right? <laughs> it's about othering the other. It's about telling the other in their face, you are another, you know? <laughs> so othering, just to give you an example, in the negotiations between the Croats, the Serbs, and the Bosnians in 1992, right? Um, well, Serbo Croat is the same language, and three communities speak it. When they met to discuss the peace process, they demanded that translators be brought in. They said, oh, we don't, they speak the same language, but now it's become Serbian, Croatian, and, um, and, and, um, and Bosnian. And when you ask for translation, when you offer translation, you are saying to the party, I want to help you, but you are at a distance from me. And then it continues, the approach of mutual accommodation and respect for difference is the only one which will offer real progress. So this is a, an offer of conciliation. You know, let's try to, you know, the, so this is what you would do in diplomacy and political terms. But here you see a very clear example of what language speaks of and speaks for, for a particular individual, maybe for more people, not instrumentally, but symbolically, and how all those meanings of Irish are pressed into service for task orientation as proxies for doing politics in society, doing it in, uh, through the back door, but sometimes through the front door. Thank you very much. Pardon? Right, I, I started late, by the way. I was here, I was here early, so, okay. I thought it was interesting this discourse that you brought up because the discussion that she is broaching is she is willing to accommodate by offering translation with the full acknowledgement that the other side which she is accommodating requires it meaning they don't you know the the other side doesn't know both languages but she has to by nature of the relationship so I think that was an interesting way of further pointing to the difference, the othering, but also acknowledging the accommodations that have been made by nature of being bilingual in order to participate in political processes. So I thought that was just a further thing to think about and was rather interesting in her very good dig at the situation. I think the word dig is, is exactly the word because this is a, an ideological duel through language. There, this, is, this is a fight in the jungle, right? But language is, is, is the arena, as it were, so, yeah. But I, I, I think you're absolutely right, but it goes even further, because I know the two languages, this is a native language, it's native to the native land, you are, you are from the outside, you know, so she's actually, this is about the in-group, the out-group, exclusion, inclusion, who's in, who's out, who's with me, who's against me, it's all of this is just encapsulated in this little, you know, but also other things uh, that have been used. But I'd like also to emphasize, to see how the symbols, the Palestinian conflict becomes a symbol. The soup becomes a symbol. The poster becomes a symbol. So in the sectarian dimension, it's not just language as instrumentality and symbolism, but the cultural world becomes, has the potential of becoming symbolic of, 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 of difference. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, interesting talk. I wonder, uh, 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 I wonder if the conflict sees, or of, uh, or if the different parties are getting into agreement, and they are getting in a peaceful uh, process that uh, they emphasize the language and uh, the symbols that you mentioned, rather than having arms. 
I wonder what are the symbols uh, during the 60s and the 70s, rather than seeing, for example, uh, the people who were killed in the conflict, uh, posters of uh, uh, guns and automatic guns, uh, uh, their um, uh, uh, liberation slogans are replaced by the Palestinian flags, by another conflict somewhere else, uh, by a soup, by concentrating in the language and insulting the others. And uh, sometimes I think that, for example, joking and mocking each other is a process of accepting the other. I wonder if this is uh, something that you can touch on. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I think the question of language in, Northern, in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, has been there for a long, long time. Um, and it was used before the establishment of the Free State in 1923. So somehow this is a continuation. I just looked at a slice. I mean, so this, this is something which has deep historical roots. Um, and in fact, it's quite interesting. Um, the Irish typeface, you have seen books in Irish type, you know, it is the font, the Irish font is very different from, the, there's a special Irish font, because you also uh, can say something about yourself through the font you use. Um, but what I want to say is that, um, so language has a historical depth as a symbol of, of, of difference, of demarcation. Um, now, I think it might go into sleep, because identity lies dormant, uh, as uh, Zygmunt Bowman says in his book on identity, he says, uh, it's conflict that brings identity to the, to the fore. Identity sleeps, and, you know, and uh, in a recent paper that I've written, I, I use the example of um, football teams. Now, the fans of football teams, they can sit during normal times when the season is not on. They can sit and have a pint of beer together, a drink, and socialize. And then when they go to, the, uh, to watch a, ma uh, a match, the teams, you know, they go in different directions, of course. They, they would just split straight away. Nobody pushes the slit, they just split. And then they can taunt each other. And then if things become, become nasty, and then they start to, to fight with each other, so you could see that uh, the, the, in the summer, it is dormant. It's not really all that, you know. Then it wakes up, and then gets accentuated, and there comes a time. So what I want to say here is that there's a multiplicity of symbolic um, um, icons to be used. So you can have uh, now the Campbell soup, now the curry, you know, now all of those. So you can actually expand the repertoire. The repertoire is expanding. The Palestine-Israel thing wasn't there in 1960s and 70s. Um, but now it is there. Maybe there will be something else in the future. But it's always based on the question of symbols, of keeping the distinction between the communities. Uh, it's about um, task orientation. It's about the cohesion of the in-group and the exclusion of the out-group. It can be low intensity. It can be high intensity. It can be, so it is a dynamic moving picture. It's not a static picture. And um, I was actually surprised when I saw the, the Campbell soup more than the other one, um, and then how somebody packaged it in order to taunt the nationalist group. No, nobody would have, I haven't thought about it, although uh, I know about Campbell's soups. So yeah, the meanings somehow remain not constant. They remain sort of there, and then they get exploited, and the expressions of them get sort of symbolized and iconized in different ways. Um, now, maybe with deep historical reconciliation, those signs of difference will start to disappear. In fact, support for Irish and in the Republic of Ireland was a lot, lot higher during the liber liberation period than it is now. It is not a great issue, it's not the great issue it used to be in 1950, and 1940, and 1920, and 1930. It's quite also interesting, really very interesting for us in this part of the world, is to see how the Arab-Israeli conflict comes into it. Um, let just give me another example. We have always talked about, the Israeli scholars, Jewish scholars, have always talked about the revival of Hebrew. Hebrew was a dead language which was revived, right? And there was a turning point when revival started to give way to revitalization of Hebrew. Because in the Irish context, 
the concept is not revival, it's revitalization. And then lots of conferences started to happen involving Israeli scholars and Irish scholars. And then the concept of revival started to become revitalization. And if you look at Israeli cinema, you'll find that they'll always have about liberation and all the rest of it. They always have a, an, an Irish character. Because Israelis have a difficulty, because colonialism and settler colonialism, it's, it has a color dimension. Now, they want to say, well, the, the colonizer doesn't have, have, always have to be white. They can all, uh, the colonizer is always white, mostly white. And the colonized doesn't have always to be black, right? Or dark. Look at the Irish. They're white. They're of the same religion. They've been colonized by the British. So they've always started sort of to say, okay, we have, we can graft our own case at the, at the, at the, at the Southern Irish, at the Republic of, at the Irish, you know. So what I want to say, these meanings change. They get exploited, manipulated. Uh, they get invented. They get amplified. They go to sleep. Then they wake up. And when they wake up, they will have lost some weight. Then they'll start to eat passion and emotion, and they'll start to grow muscle. So we need to actually sort of watch and keep sort of watching. But I've taken this slice because it just it gives you a very accentuated, condensed, very sharp uh, picture of, of how this model could actually work. Because I'm really interested in what I now have started to call model in f this framework, which I've used elsewhere, uh, which I can, you know, I'm testing it against other, you know, it's tested in Israel, in Lebanon, and other places in India and Pakistan. Uh, um, so, yeah, I think there, it's bound. There will be other. Um, now you see very few arms on the on the streets, uh, murals of arms. But you see, it is what what is they call diplomacy is pursuing or is what is diplomacy is pursuing war through other means or you know that's or or, uh, or war is pursuing diplomacy through other means. There's this yeah. Is it the second one? The second one. Diplomacy is or war is what is okay. Can you tell me? I've got politics by other means, diplomacy by other means, and I think um, you'll always find ways of doing war through other means. This is sort of culture war. This is keeping keeping things sort of on on simmering and on a low fire until such a time when they can be woken up and then say, "Now, my friend, you've got to do some work for us." Yeah, of course, yes. Uh, why I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the Jordanian case, I'm always anxious when there are no jokes between the Palestinians and the Jordanians in Jordan. I feel that there is a tension between the two communities. When we have a wide range of jokes, that means the two communities are able to communicate their stereotypes and to laugh about them and to be, um, I don't know, I mean, maybe to to diffuse the tension. And I wonder if these, all, of this, all of these samples is part of the process of getting closer to each other. That's what I'm, uh, that's what I'm trying you know, to think. Uh, no, I, I don't think they are. Uh, the reason why is that um, you, you are still at a very low intensity kind of conflict. In fact, what happened in the uh, St. Andrews Agreement in particular, is it the standard St. Andrews? Yeah, St. Andrew's agreement. It was a very difficult agreement. And the loyal, the, the, the unions were sort of did not want to sign the agreement. They were dead against it. 11 weeks or no. Maybe storm it. I can't remember which one. Then Tony Blair came and said, OK, now I know this is going to fail. I am going to uh, put through the parliament an act to make Irish an official language of Northern Ireland. And within no time, <laughs> So I think they haven't got, they, of course they joke about each other. The Campbell is a joke. And the other one is a joke. They're all jokes. But they're jokes with a very dark side to them. So for, I mean, and I have a big chapter in my book, A War of, uh, War of Words, about Jordan. About, you know, and generally what happens, and what happened in Jordan when the state started to build itself on a different kind of, um, along different lines, then immediately you will need to notice that ethnic slurs, ethnic labels, ethno-linguistic tables start to appear. appear. So Jordanians, Palestinians in Jordan became Baljiki. Huh? But now I think the young generations don't really know what Baljiki, Baljiki means. Right? Now they use it as a joke. But there was a time when it wasn't really a joke. 
But that's where reconciliation has taken place and things have developed. And now you know, I refer to myself, oh, I'm a Belgique, right? Whereas in, yeah. But the most experimentation with the Palestinians started saying that we are Yeah, yeah. No, at that time, actually, what happened, because I, 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 can, I have a me memory of it, and, and my chapter talks about my memory of it, um, Palestinians started to refer to the Jordanians because it was about the Ga and the A, and they started to call them Garadna, no? from Qirt, from monkeys, right? But it never took, it didn't talk, take hold because power wasn't on its side, right? So there always, there's always the other, you know. But I think Palestinians now joke about it because we have moved on from 1970, intermarriages, actually the Jordanians, Palestinian Jordanians, maybe, uh, I hope this will not never happen. If, if King Abdullah were to call on people to save his, mon uh, his throne, th it would be the Palestinians who will save him now. Um, uh, this, is a, this is a joke, of course. This is an exaggerated you know, um, uh, statement. But what I want to say, yes, um, but you need a long process. For example, in Scotland and England, there are lots of jokes about about um, being Scottish, being particularly English. I was watching one this morning. I advise you all to, to look at something called Mind Your Language. This is a 1970s program, maybe if you know. And the, the, the one I was watching this morning, uh, you know, there are all these foreigners. Do you watch it? Yeah? It's a great one, yeah? It's all full of stereotypes. But this one that I was watching this morning, it has, of course, you have the Chinese, you have the Japanese, you have the Germans, you have the French, you have the Spanish, you have the Italians, you have the Sikh, you have the Muslim. You don't have an Arab, right? You have men, you have women. But in this episode, they bring in a Scot who's a pilot. And he's got to learn English. <laughs> so he comes and, of course, he speaks Scottish. Uh, and then uh, they say to the teacher, I mean, this is, and this is the joke that goes on. So they, they, say, to, they say to the teacher, uh, this Italian guy says to him, so what does he speak? He says, oh, he speaks English. He said, so why aren't you learning this language? Ah, why can't you understand it? Why is he here? You know? But by bringing the Scot into a foreign language classroom, they're saying you are foreign, right? And this is the joke, but the Scots can take it. You know, and if you look at Rapsi Nesbet in Scotland, uh, when he jokes in his, in his comedy, there will always be English translations of what he says. Most of it, as an English person, you can understand, but there's a translation, right? But that is, I think now you will see if Scotland starts to push towards independence and becomes ugly, those jokes will not have the same meaning. They will have, start to have a different kind of meaning. So at times of when you are sort of relaxed, jokes are all right, but when you become in a different kind of space, then jokes become, that's my, my feeling. But here there's, there's an element of laughter, but not joking. There's laughter, but not joking. It's laughter at the expense of the other party, not to humor, to have humor, but to insult them. And they, they refer to it as slur. It's a slur. They don't understand it's a joke. It's a slur. These are their words. I think Dana will say, we're done, because you're in a well, thank you very much. As I said, all I wanted to say is that how do I, as a linguist, sort of enter this conversation with you? Because you're the absolute real champions and specialists. So I thought maybe we, as the party that gets excluded all the time in the institute here, every time I talk about, they say, oh, because in Tel Aviv, you're a linguist. And I say, oh, well, your language is just opens your brain to me. And I'm, I'm not interested in language for language. I'm, anyway, but uh, we linguists get, tend to get sort of excluded. And I'm hoping that. Maybe we can make ourselves relevant to the social sciences, interdisciplinarity, Ashraf is there, by doing this kind of work, uh, in addition to caring about the verb to be and also the past participle. So thank you very much indeed.